The process that AMO uses to assess the network adages uh, has had to change in the past few years uh, due to the increasing number of inverter based plant connecting across the NEM. A lot of this new generation is connecting in locations where we've never had generators connected before. These generally weaker parts of the system uh, had their network designed to supply a local load um, and are generally quite far from the existing synchronous generation fleet and major metropolitan loads. So in the past, these locations were quite simple to go and assess the outages. The, uh, most of the assessment probably had to worry about was uh, the, whether the demands were going to be too high under hot weather conditions. Now, assessing these outages become much more complex. For starters, we have to coordinate with a quite large number of generators who could be affected by this outage, and they could cross state borders and ownership boundaries. So between different NSPs, whether they're tr transmission or distribution. So for example, in Northwest Victoria and Southwest New South Wales, we've got two transmission owners and two distribution owners. And dozens of generators there. And an outage in New South Wales can actually, as well as uh, affect generators in New South Wales, will also affect generators in Victoria and vice versa. The other part here is that a number of these generators are being built and operated by new players in the NEM, and they are not necessarily as familiar with some of the processes and um, data sources um, that the other players are. So they've got a steep learning curve um, to find out where to find the, the network outage list um, or find out what a constraint set is or why, why are they being curtailed. So this adds to the coordination complexity here. Now where a generator has remediated their system strength limits under system normal conditions, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have no limits under outage conditions. In fact, most of the time they're going to have some form of a limit under outage conditions. The system strength limits uh, generally take the form of a megawatt limit on a plant, which a dispatch engine can understand, and in some cases an inverter uh, limitation, which AMO's dispatch engine uh, can't work with. So that adds another layer to the coordination of the outage. So the generators need to be made aware that they're going to have inverter limits and they need to be prepared before the outage. The other thing that occurs here is the network and the generators is changing quite rapidly. So the limits being determined for these outages is also changing rapidly. And so there's a lot of work for generators to actually keep up to date with all the latest changes in, in, in the limits. It's also a lot of work for the NSPs to keep up to date with all the, the, the limit changes. The other complexity we've got with assessing outages um, for looking at any system strength issues is we don't have any online tools to go and assess system strength yet. We're actually heavily reliant on PSCAD studies to do this sort of work. So Normally when we go and assess an outage, we, we, we use our energy management system. We can run a power flow, run some voltage stability and transient stability studies and go and assess an outage. And it um, doesn't take us too long. PSCAD studies take hours. Um, so we're heavily reliant on having the, the limited advice from NSPs up to date so we can, we, we, we can look, look at how an outage might run. There is a development occurring um, at AEMO. Um, we're in the final stages of testing a low fault level tool, which will alarm on low fault levels. Uh, so that has some promise to help us assess our outages and identify where we might have system strength issues. Another new aspect where we need to take into account when assessing outages, which we didn't have to before, is the requirement for having synchronous generators to be online to manage a post-contingent scenario. So for example, uh, South Australia needs certain synchronous generators to be online when we're at risk of islanding of South Australia. And that can occur for outages in Victoria and in South Australia. So now those outages can only run at times where those synchronous plants are online. In the past, most of the transmission and generation outages occurred in the shoulder season. 
So with a requirement for synchronous generators to be online and with our demands dropping even lower, it's getting much harder to manage these risk of islanding outages because the likelihood of the generators to be offline is quite high. And we're also now starting to see requirements in Victoria for uh, synchronous generators to be online. AMO receives advice from network owners about the capability of their systems. This limit advice, whether it be for system normal or outage conditions, is converted by AMO into something our dispatch engine can understand. These are called constraint equations. So for example, uh, if a network owner produces a transient stability limit, they would generally go and run dozens hundreds, thousands of studies in, in PSSE, perform regression analysis to produce a linear equation. We can then convert that linear equation into a constraint equation. And these can be relatively complex if there's lots of terms on this equation um, or there's some simple logic in there. Um, but we've had an established process for many years to you know, build and test and convert these in, into constraint equations. On the other hand, System strength limits are determined using PSCAD, which takes much longer to run. So it's a smaller set of studies that are run. In terms of the constraint equations we have for system strength, they run the full gamut from the most simple constraints we have in the system through to the most complex ones we have. So for example, in terms of some of the adages uh, we were speaking about in the previous slide, they're generally curtailing a generator under adage conditions to a simple megawatt limit. So 50% of output or 25% output. These are constraint equations look like generator less than or equal to 25% of output. Quite simple in, in, in those. They can get a bit more complicated if we have to deal with inverter limits. Now the dispatch engine doesn't deal with inverter limits, but we have a check in the dispatch engine. So if a generator is over its inverter limit, it'll actually get targeted zero. So there's a bit of logic to find that piece. Then we get into our most complex constraints where Dozens and dozens of PSCAD studies have been run and there are interactions with other generators in the network, synchronous condensers uh, and so on. And so what you end up with is not a linear equation to produce a constraint equation, you end up with a lookup table. So what we have to do when we build a constraint equation is we have to go and build every piece of logic determining that lookup table into the constraint equation. So for example, for the South Australian system strength limit, which provides a, uh, a megawatt cap on the amount of solar and wind generation in South Australia, depending on the uh, generator combination in place, and there's dozens of these, we've had to build every single combination into the logic in that constraint. We have a similar one, uh, uh, tables that we, we have to build for the Queensland system strength constraint. Where their complexity is, is not in, in the logic. There are less combinations there, but they are on a large number of generators. So we have to produce a, uh, up to 12 uh, equations uh, for a number of generators. So it's complex enough. So um, the com adding complexity constraints means also that market participants uh, are having more difficulty understanding some of these constraints. Um, so there's a lot of work we're having to do with uh, participants and understanding the constraints. Obviously with PSCAD, it's more complex to calculate these limits. And we have a quite a rapid changing system. So where we might have an outage 12 months ago, there's a whole batch of new generators that have appeared now, and we have to have the limits ready for that, um, for, for, the, for the outage now. And as every generator comes along, we need to go and recalculate the limits. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Andrew Halley, I'm the Principal Operations Engineer at TAS Networks and today I'd like to talk about the combined impact of low system strength and low inertia in islanded power systems. So the discussion items that I'd like to focus on are as follows. Recognise that low system strength and low inertia operating conditions can overlap at times. Recognise that low system strength conditions will allow low voltages to propagate further through the network during fault events than they otherwise would if, if there was more synchronous machines online. The concept of voltage induced frequency deviations and throughout I'll try and provide some examples from the Tasmanian system uh, to just demonstrate how these things play out in practice. So 
as a number of presenters have already mentioned today, system strength is usually linked to the resilience of the voltage waveforms, being the reactivity and controllability of the voltages when changes in the power system occur, whether these be small or large signal uh, disturbances. However, we know from our understanding of the theory that inertia also plays a major role in power system stability. So while inertia and system strength tend to be talked about separately, it's important to recognise that there is a, uh, a zone of overlap, as shown uh, in the centre of the Venn diagram there, where there are certain issues that are impacted by both inertia and system strength and not just one or the other. So some examples that I've listed are impacts on IBR control and protection schemes and systems, uh, transient stability, electromechanical small signal instabilities, and the, the key topic for today's discussions uh, being voltage-induced frequency disturbances. So while the mechanisms of delivery are, are different for uh, inertia and, and system strength, it is reasonable to conclude that certain network stability issues will be influenced by a combination of both factors and not just one or the other. So we know that a reduced number of voltage sources in the network will certainly allow low voltage conditions to propagate further than they otherwise would when, when fault events occur. Um, the lack of synchronous machines uh, in the network will, will simply allow those fault conditions to uh, extend uh, further through the network than they otherwise would. And this of course allows more uh, inverter-based resources to see the fault and, and respond in accordance with their fault ride through behaviour. So just as an example of uh, something that happened in Tasmania back in late August, uh, we had a line-to-line -to, -line to ground fault at uh, Riston substation, which is uh, just outside of Hobart, so it's in southern Tasmania. And what we observed was that uh, all of our major wind farms and the Basslink interconnector, uh, all sites actually entered fault ride through for that particular fault event. Um, and the reason for that was that we had low system strength uh, conditions uh, at the time. And that was largely driven by uh, moderate wind generation. Um, we were on import, so we were importing power from Victoria. Uh, so about 367 megawatts of flow on Basslink. Um, a little bit of solar PV, uh, operational demand a little bit lower than, than normal but uh, not extreme. Our inertia was also a little bit lower than normal but uh, certainly not as low as we have seen it uh, and the overall non-synchronous penetration ratio at the time was about 70%. So as a result of those low voltage conditions being able to propagate essentially across the entire state, uh, and the, the wind farms and Basslink all going into fault ride through, uh, what we've been able to uh, recreate using our uh, PMU measurements is exactly how much uh, active power was temporarily withdrawn and how much uh, energy deficit uh, we actually suffered during, the, uh, during that fault period. So as shown there on the figure, uh, the, the pre-fault conditions were about 670 megawatts or thereabouts. Of, uh, of active power being delivered from uh, IBR sources and then the fault occurs and uh, some 450 megawatts temporarily withdraws and takes approximately 660 milliseconds to actually recover to those post-fault uh, operating levels. Uh, the slight overshoot that you can see here is due to the frequency controller response on Basslink. So it increased import to compensate for a, a low frequency condition, which you can see in the in the next figure here. So as a, just as a result of the fault event, without any loss of generation or, or any significant change in um, load conditions, uh, what we've seen is that frequency actually fell from pretty much uh, rated conditions down to 49.43 hertz. Um, within that 660 milliseconds. Um, and that's completely driven by the, the fault ride through behavior of, uh, of the wind farms and Basslink. The, the average rate of change, if you, if you look at it over uh, a 500 millisecond period is, is approximately one hertz per second, 
which again is, is also not insignificant uh, when you consider that this is it's just simply a network fault and, uh, and didn't involve any other uh, loss of equipment. So hence the concept of a voltage-induced frequency deviation. So just to recap on the sequence of events, the fault ride-through creates a period of transient, transient energy deficit within the network. Uh, another example is shown there in the, the figure on the right, uh, which is a type three wind, wind farm uh, entering fault ride through. And you can see the, the significant active power withdrawal uh, as it enters fault ride through and then uh, recovers to its pre-contingency operating level. The energy deficit caused by the fault ride through response is in addition to any generation that may have been disconnected from the network as a result of the fault event itself. And of course, this drives a power imbalance uh, during and immediately after the network fault, which causes a, a frequency disturbance. The magnitude of that frequency disturbance is a function of the amount of IBR that is affected and its, a pre, and its pre contingency output, which is all in turn a function of system strength and, and how, uh, how far those low voltages have been allowed to, to propagate through the network. It's certainly a function of system inertia and the resulting rate of change of frequency that occurs during the imbalance period or during that period of um, transient energy deficit. And uh, interestingly, and this is sort of a subject of, of some ongoing uh, research and discussion, um, the, the frequency disturbance that, that actually occurs is very much a function of the, the, the fast frequency response capability that's available and not impacted by the fault event. So in, in larger systems where you may have FFR capability sitting on, on plant that um, doesn't see the fault but is you know, all electrically connected, uh, it can compensate and, uh, and dramatically reduce the, uh, the resulting frequency disturbance. Of course, in an islanded system or a, a smaller system, um, you may not have that uh, you may not have that FFR capability to begin with, but it also um, may itself become impacted by the fault event. So hence the, the issues tend to compound in, in smaller power systems. So it's clear that this issue is already important for Tasmania uh, when it comes to management of frequency, but in my opinion, it's also likely to become relevant in other NEM regions. Uh, and South Australia seems to be a, a good candidate as does North Queensland uh, when it's operating uh, islanded from the, the rest of the NEM. So just to consider the impacts on FCAS requirements and power system security more generally, uh, what I've done here is simulated uh, the loss of a large wind farm under a, a very onerous network condition that we experienced back on the 13th of September, uh, where we had 85, nearly 85 and a half percent of IBR penetration. Uh, made up of quite a lot of wind, very high import, and, uh, and relatively low uh, system inertia. So the blue trace is loss of one particular wind farm, uh, just as a result of a straight trip and, uh, and uh, opening of the transmission line which connects it to the network. The red simulation as shown there is the uh, loss of the same wind farm, uh, but with a, with a fault applied. And as you can see, the difference in the frequency in it is is approximately 0.3 hertz, so quite a significant difference in relative terms. The, the rock-off difference is also significantly different. Uh, the non-fault event is approximately half hertz per second, uh, whereas the application of a fault uh, causes rock-off to, uh, to rise to well, what, certainly over one and a half hertz per second. So it's clear that uh, the energy deficit due to IBR fault ride through needs to be properly considered when assessing power system security outcomes. And this sort of uh, simulated event certainly highlights the importance of uh, the active power recovery requirements, which are covered under Schedule 5.2.5.5 of the National Electricity Rules and just how important they are uh, for smaller power systems and certainly the Tasmanian region. So just in summary then, uh, low system strength conditions allow voltage disturbances to propagate further across the network. As a result of that, more IBR will see the fault and uh, respond in accordance with it, the, the fault ride through strategies. Uh, that fault ride through response creates a period of transient energy deficit, uh, which 
drives uh, a larger network frequency disturbance than you would otherwise see. When system inertia is low at the same time, uh, that resulting frequency change can be substantial. There are definitely impacts on, on rock-off uh, as well as FCAS requirements and uh, that could in turn actually affect transient stability outcomes depending on the network characteristics. And one issue that I haven't talked about today, but I'm sure that you can put your minds to and, uh, and, and realise the, the potential impact of, and that is the, the risk of sympathetic loss of DER uh, due to low voltages and or high rock off, and, and how uh, any loss of DER, such as um, photovoltaics, uh, would only compound the issues that have been discussed. So thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and uh, we'll talk again soon. Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about increasing need for system testing and monitoring. I'll use next couple of slides to set the scene before going into system testing and monitoring. Previous presenters have already alluded that the name, in particularly some regions of the name are moving from a synchronous generation dominated region to IBR dominated region. There is a growing concentration of IBR in the remote part of the grid, which increases the complexity of the system operation and could lead to undesired interaction between IBRs and system performance. One such undesired system performance was observed in 2015 when one of the lines was taken out of service. The system noticed seven hertz voltage oscillations with 5% peak-to-peak -peak magnitude. By the way, this was a localized phenomena. Fast forward to 2019, many of you would be aware about system strength issues in West Murray area and the constraint that was applied to limit number of inverters in that area. On 30th of November and 1st of December 2019, AMO and relevant NSPs performed a series of power system switching tests in the West Murray area. The test involved opening of a transmission line for about 15 seconds. During the test, the constraint related to number of inverters online has been applied. Immediately after opening the line, 7 Hz oscillations were observed. However, the magnitude of these oscillations was ranging from 0.1% to 0.5% peak-to-peak -peak, depending upon the location. This emphasized the need to carry out system testing. The results confirmed the oscillation predicted by the earlier large-scale power system models. Taking one step further, the next slide shows how this oscillation looks like. Figure on the left shows field measurement at one of the sides while figure on the right shows benchmarking of the large scale EMT model against the test. As you can see, the modeling of the system test successfully able to replicate to a certain extent what was observed during the test. The message here is that the system testing and benchmarking of model should complement each other. This slide further shows a comparison between model and system test. This particular test was carried out after a solution in West Murray was implemented which further confirms the message that the system testing is important and it would help to validate models. Moving from system testing to monitoring, the next slide shows what could be picked up by having sufficient monitoring across the name. This slide shows 19 Hertz oscillations, which was observed a couple of months back this was picked up as a byproduct of an investigation for another event. The magnitude of these oscillations ranging from 0.2% to 1% peak-to-peak. -peak. Since then, such undesired system performance 
has been observed without any major disturbance in the system. The magnitude of oscillations ranging from very low to sometime as high as 1.3 percent peak to peak. Another interesting aspect is that these oscillations are intermittent and last from 10 second to sometime 120 second which makes it difficult to monitor through traditional SCADA system which is too slow to capture such phenomena. In terms of improved monitoring and automatic detection of undesired system performance that can't be captured through slow SCADA system, in the last few weeks, AEMO has developed an in-house tool that monitors voltage anomaly in Northwest Victoria. Currently, it is only looking at one location. The limitation mainly because the high speed data for other locations in that area is not available to AMO. The slide shows what this tool, which was developed in house, picked up. These are 19 Hertz oscillation. This slide shows another example that was picked up by bespoke monitoring tool that I was talking about in the previous slide. For this particular instant, it was related to mal functioning of the controller loop in one plant and that one plant is an inverter based plant or IBR. Nevertheless, this shows the importance of monitoring in an area where large amount of IBRs are connected. So in summary, there is an increasing need to be proactive and facilitate systems test. Learning from system test would be complementary to modeling results. System test would facilitate identification of root cause. It is important to have real-time monitoring with synchronized measurement. That way, we can analyze system better. Increased monitoring would complement detailed modeling rather than replacing it. AEMO is working with NSP to bring in more PMU streams into AEMO system to improve monitoring. Thank you very much.